I like the fact that it was it's a fairly nebulous name for a film. You don't want to be too on the nose because then it sounds a bit B movie if you do that. And I sort of entertain ideas that people are going to say, why don't you call it Digital Demon or something like that? And why don't you change the poster to this or that? But um, I like it when you have to think about it a bit. And because we feature screens in the film, you know, um, laptops and phones and so forth, and the, the demon does appear on those things. So there is something to do with looking at a screen and not understanding what it is. So there is a blurring of reality or blurring of understanding or something like that. So it kind of works. And it's the less you give away, the kind of creepier it is for me too. Yeah, the origin of the story many moons ago. Um, I think it was originally going to be another short film because I worked with Ian and Cassia and Guy on Limousine and that was really satisfying that we did that and you know, I was really pleased and I wanted to go straight into doing something else. Um, and I was going to do another short sort of horror film. It was going to be about a some sort of DVD menu that's possessed or something like that and it was going to repeat and repeat but every time it repeats it was going to be a little different and creepy but I could never figure out how to make that into a film. So I took the idea of why don't we make it a, a photograph of something and that's possessed and once it gets into the electronics it infiltrates into the apartment and then we can shoot it in our apartment and we can keep the cost down and so forth. So that was kind of the origin. It was I reverse engineered it from the fact that we were shooting in our apartment first and I asked my wife and said, hey honey, can we shoot for a whole year of weekends, please? And she went, sure. <laughs> and we were kind of, okay, now we can do this. And uh, and that was kind of how we did it. So yeah, I, I've, I used to make TV commercials and music videos back in the old days. And uh, when we did our first movie, Fragment, we shot that on anamorphic 35 millimeter, which was lovely. And, uh, and then there was a bit of a gap and then digital came along and I'd never really shot digital, but when we did Limousine, that was, me busting my cherry. I shot on digital and I was really happy with the results. It looked like 35 millimetre to my eye. So we were going to commit to shooting on that format. And um, we used some great lenses that, you know, were provided by Rob who shot the film. And uh, and the, uh, the whole idea was to make it look like 35 millimetre. And in fact, we knew we weren't going to be able to go in and do a digital intermediate or, or tweak it very much because we had no money. So the idea was whatever we shot and whatever looked right on the screen to us was what we lived with. And I remember when we went to Martin, who did the post-production, I said to Martin, look, I think, um, I don't think you need to, you know, tweak anything. And he went, you're crazy. You know, all feature films shot digitally, we tweak every single shot. And he said, oh, there's about 20 shots. And he went, you're kidding. But when I showed him the movie, he looked at it and went, wow, you're right. What, what you shot was pretty much it. So... That was really cool. But, yeah, I think digital's really come of age. I think in the last sort of 10 years it looks like 35mm now. So um, I think maybe we made the film at just the right time. <laughs> so I, I have a lot of influences from past filmmakers. Um, and in this instance I think the influences were mainly Kubrick and The Shining <clears throat> and Brian De Palma with a, quite a bit of David Fincher as well. So I wanted to go for an elegant horror film the whole idea was to create a a spell, put you under a spell for 100 minutes that doesn't break. It's just there from the first shot to the end shot. And, um, and very obviously looking at how to create scares within rooms that are done with camera movements and all that sort of stuff. So that was the, where The Shining came in and the Fincher influence came in and the set pieces between the minutiae of things that was Brian De Palma's sort of influence and I hope that my next movie is going to be much more of a Brian De Palma-esque kind of film. But, um, yeah, that was that's always the thing. When you make a horror film or when you make any film, you know it's going to go on the shelf and it's going to sit next to somebody's work. Um, so you want to make it as damn good as you can, you know. You're always, you're always trying for a masterpiece. It sounds sort of wanky, but it's true. You want to try and make a masterpiece. I think looking at television and HBO and where it is now, there's there's almost, you know, unless you have stars in a movie, you know, you don't want to do a drama because there's just too much choice and people are spoiled for choice. They have known actors and so forth. But with horror films, they have their own audience already kind of there. And also from my perspective, I think as an act, as a director, you can play around 
you can do surreal things, you can play with lighting, you can play with sequences and things that you can't do in dramas. In dramas, you have to be, you just have to keep it real. And um, blur is definitely not real, it's, it's definitely a fabrication. So I get to have a lot more fun. But it was more like the upper tens of thousands to actually get it in the can and to get it to that point. But I know it'll be in the hundreds of thousands by the time we have to pay everyone. And um, yeah, and uh, I think because I've spent so many years making low budget things, I kind of know what I'm doing. And I did my own art department and costuming and all that sort of stuff. And so that was the thing, as long as I had the time, and which is why we shot on weekends, I had the week that I could get my props and organize for Saturday. And then I had a whole nother week to organize for the next Saturday and all that sort of thing. And that was the only way we could do it. Otherwise, I'd have to have a crew of 10 running around and, you know, I didn't have the money. We were just going week by week on our salaries to pay for the film, really. You know, it was very indie, painfully indie. <laughs> we were able to keep costs down, you know, by doing it slowly. Obviously, um, you know, I, I could go and do everything. I, I could organise the effects, organise the costumes, get the props, get the lights, get the this, get the that. And I had time to think and do it all. And, um, and also I think, you know, going widescreen, I think, uh, made the apartment look bigger. And we'd done that previously on Fragment, our first film. And, um, yeah, you just learn a lot of tricks by doing ads and by doing, you know, by filming before. It's, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of years shooting that have come to this point. And, you know, Rob, who was our DOP, was phenomenal. He really did everything. He panned, he tilted, he focused, he did the dolly work all himself. I mean, it was kind of amazing. Um, and everyone was taking on four or five roles at the same time. I mean, literally, you know, it'd be me, Ian and Rob. We would like the three guys working the camera. Um, and some days it would simply be Ian shooting stuff and, you know, me pulling the strings or doing the effect shots or doing the matte paintings or something like that. Uh, so, but you, we knew what we were doing. We, we'd been doing this for more than 20 years. So it wasn't hard, it was just time, you know, it was laborious. <laughs>